Sunday afternoons on one of the off channels on Bull. Uh, maybe it's Get or something like that. <clears throat> but on our TV, it's like channel 1261 or some ridiculous amount like that. But they play film noir movies, black and white, old 40s, 50s, 30s style. And I really appreciate movies like that because it shows the shadows, conveys the feelings and the emotions. They're raw, they're powerful. When I look at the 22nd Psalm, that's exactly what I see. I see it as something that's shadows, powerful, ominous, and that's what's being conveyed. David is running at the time of the 22nd Psalm. He's a fugitive running from Saul. Ultimately, he's going he's gonna to be victorious, yes. But right now, when he writes this, as well as several other of the Psalms that he would write. He feels alone. He feels isolated. Anguish comes to the forefront. But there is also the appeal, the appeal for help, for longing. David was inspired. In 2 Samuel 23 and 2, it talks about it, how he was inspired And so what he writes, he does write of his feelings, his emotions, but it's also prophetic, looking forward to. And so when you begin to read it, <coughs> excuse me, and hold it in context, it's powerful. Because what he's explaining under inspiration is the attitudes that are going to be held by the Messiah as he faces the cross, as he's on the cross. And so he's, you might say, channeling the thoughts of what Jesus is going to go through. It is true emotion, true feeling. And when you look at it, you stand in awe of the power and of the beauty of it. Because there is beauty, absolute beauty. Those film noir movies I mentioned, they have a certain beauty that's all their own. And I love black and white photography. I love the 22nd Psalm. I love the 23rd Psalm because the 22nd Psalm is, is ominous. It is shadow. It is emotion. 23rd Psalm is technicolor. It's the vibrancy. And each one plays off the other. Each one written by David in different times of his life. And it paints a very powerful, very beautiful portrait of all that the Messiah is. But it also lays out in the 22nd Psalm the qualifications of a good shepherd. But go with me into the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Now, David is making that appeal. But when you go in and you begin to look at the scriptures, you see the same thing is said by Jesus. I believe it's found in John, the 16th chapter. And we drop down into... Verse 22. 
It's kind of hinted. Therefore, you too now have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away. He was talking to them about his need to go away. Now, later on that day, following day, excuse me, he's going to cry out while writhing in anguish, in pain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to turn his head away. His son became the scapegoat. The sins of mankind were dealt with at that moment. In Isaiah 59, first two verses, sin causes a separation. It's an argumentation among scholars of the scriptures with respect to did Jesus actually become sin? Was there that separation between the father and son at that nanosecond? I tend to think not. I tend to think that Jesus became the scapegoat. He said, I'm willing to accept the sins. I done no wrong, but I'm willing to pay the price for them. I think he was feeling alone, forgotten, as we do when we are hurting. Pain racks us. We begin to feel forsaken, alone. The worst time in a hospital is 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. If you've ever walked the halls at those times, you walk by rooms and you see people sitting there, staring off blankly, alone. I would get a lot of calls that people wanted to talk to me at 2 and 3 in the morning. And I'd be home, and I'd get the call, and drive down to the hospital, and the tears would be flowing down their faces, alone, forsaken. That's what Jesus felt. The raw emotion. He had emotions, like you and I do. But he didn't sin but he paid the price for sin. But if you go back to the 22nd Psalm and you drop down in verses 3 and 4 of that 22nd Psalm, you see something kind of powerful. Yet thou art holy, although thou, excuse me, who art earthbound and thrown upon the praises of Israel. In thee our fathers trusted. They trusted that it's delivered them. In a sense, he's crying out and saying, my trust is with you. It's true trust. But again, looking at it from the standpoint of prophetic attitude of the Messiah, the abject humility that is seen in verse 6. I am a worm and not a man. A reproach of men despised to the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Was Christ welcomed with open arms? Quite the contrary. The Pharisees, the others of the Jewish nation, sought to ridicule him, sought to ostracize, and sought to murder him. So yeah, 22nd Psalm, a cry of anguish. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. 
There's none to help. We talked in class this morning toward the end about his, his prayer that the cup would pass. He said, the father said, no. No. I can't answer that request. But I'll send an angel down to, to strengthen you. To help you endure it. You sit back and you really drink in all that Jesus did, all that he provided, the pain, the anguish, the emotional strain. Just stop. The emotional strain. I mean, he's praying in the garden. And his sweat becomes, as it were, blood. The little capillaries in the skin begin to break. They begin to ooze out blood. All brought on by stress and anxiety. How do you feel when you're really anxious? When things are pressing on you? And your body takes on different characteristics. But imagine, you know that in less than 12 hours, you're going to be humiliated. You're going to be paraded through the streets after having been beaten, your clothing ripped off you. Throw lots for your clothes. You're going to be hung on a cross. You're going to have to carry uh, the parts of the cross to your own death. Humiliation in and of itself is terrible. But the degradation of being beaten and paraded adds to it. So he knows this is coming. talked about in Psalms 22. The raw bloodlust that they, that they have for them. Have you ever entered into a room where you know the people in there loathed you? Now, you didn't fear for your life, but you felt totally uncomfortable. Magnify that knowing that these people want nothing more than to brutalize you. It was talked about on the news yesterday about the mental state of those that have been taken hostage by Hamas. And what would the rest of their life be? I mean, looking at it from a psychological standpoint, the rest of their life is going to be tortured. Even if they're delivered right away, what they've gone through is going to be in their, in their inner being for the rest of their life. Jesus went through far more. In a truncated amount of time, he endured. But as you read on in the 21st Psalm, 22nd Psalm, look at verses 19 through 21. That David points out that even while the Messiah would be in the throes of death, he still had confidence on the Father. I'm being poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Have you ever dislocated something? I, when we lived in Las Vegas, I loved water ski. Tells you how long ago that was. But we had a member of the church who had a ski boat. 
And we would go out to Lake Mead. We had to go out to the Overton Arms of Lake Mead. We'd put out and we'd ski. And I got out and I tightened down one ski. And the other one I left kind of loose because I was going to drop it and single ski. So I dropped the one ski. Went to get outside the wake to get more speed. And somehow or another, the tip of the ski got in the water. It caught. And because I had tightened it down, it didn't release. But what did release was my left hip with a decided crack. And I lay back in the water and I couldn't even crawl up on the boat. Linda, who's on shore, probably, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, half a mile, three quarters of a mile away. And she starts to swim. She swims out all the way. And she said, I'll go with you as you come back in. And so the boat drug us, drug me back in. It was miserable. Dislocated hip. Tried to put it in on the on the on the beach, made it worse. Could you imagine your shoulders going out of place? Your hips, your elbows, pretty much every joint you have moving out of socket. That's what he's talking about. On top of the searing pain in your hands, your feet, on your back from having your, your back filleted open with a scourge. It's disgusting what they did to our Savior. Absolutely disgusting. And then to have people hurling abuse at him. Psalms 22 paints that picture. Paints it powerfully. Paints it directly. But now let's flip the page just a little bit. And we won't get through all of this. Greater love. That night in which he was taken and betrayed, Jesus told his disciples, greater love has no one than this. Then one laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do as I command you. Now all the way through his preaching, Jesus had been preparing his disciples for this time. Because if you look back at John 10, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the flock. David would understand that. David writing centuries before the coming of the Christ. Because before David was a king, he was a shepherd. And David would go out and put his life on the line in order to protect the sheep. That's why the 23rd Psalm is, is, is so powerful. Because it is the logical answer to the 22nd Psalm. And it is the fulfillment of what is seen back in the book of Ezekiel. If you go back into Ezekiel, and um, where do we want to be? Go back into... Go back into... Well, go into... 37. Yeah, going to 37. Ezekiel 37. You could go back to 36 and it'll build the, where we want to be. 
But for the sake of time, 24. 37, 24 of Ezekiel. And my servant, David. David's already been king and died. Will be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances. Keep my statutes. Flip over to Acts 2. And in Acts 2, notice the words of Peter. Drop down into verse 33. Well, actually we could go back to 24, but for the sake of time, go to 33. Therefore, having been exalted, to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Now earlier on in Acts 2, Peter had shown where it was Jesus who was on David's throne at that time. That David, when he wrote, was talking about Jesus and that it couldn't be the reincarnated form or the reanimated form of David because David has died. His tomb is with us to this day. So 22 23 of Psalms are pointing to what Jesus would do for us and how Jesus is the Messiah, made him both Lord and Messiah, the anointed one, the one shepherd over his one flock. You could take a look at um, Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Verses 20 through 22. You can see it there. That's what Jesus is. And that's the transition, a little bit of the transition that we need in order to go into the 23rd Psalm. But we'll leave it there. And we'll pick it up later on this afternoon. Looking at the 23rd Psalm and coming to have a pretty good, I think, understanding of how hand fits glove in regards to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he paid the price for us, and that he is the one true and only shepherd, and we are but his flock his sheep. And we listen to the voice of the shepherd. If you're here this morning and not a child of God, we'd love nothing more than to have the opportunity to study with you, to examine with you from God's word. But maybe you know what you need to do. That you need to put on Christ in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. We'd be more than happy to assist you. Or you need the prayers of the congregation for strength. Whatever we can do spiritually to help. Upon that cross.